Welcome everyone, we're back and I'm going to hand it over to Jarl and Kevin to take it away. Hello everyone and thank you very much for uh, joining us this afternoon to talk about the Partnerships Textile Assistance Guide for Category 8 Financial Operations and Oversight. Uh, I'm Jarl Crocker, I'm Director of Training and Textile Assistance here at the Partnership and I'm joined uh, today on the line by Kevin Myron who's the primary author of the Technical Assistance Guide. Uh, Kevin is a CPA, he is also a CFO of Common Bond Communities and a board member of a community action agency. So Kevin brings a wide variety of expertise with us today. Um, so we, uh, as Cashin said, we'll make sure that we take time to pause after each uh, standard uh, to answer your questions because we know that this is one of the more technical categories and one that um, we've gotten a, a fair number of questions on in the past. So uh, again, the uh, uh, guide for category eight uh, is completed in draft form. Uh, we at the partnership are reviewing and making edits and we should be able to get that up and live to you um, by Friday uh, at the very latest. So uh, again, be looking for that on our website. Uh, it will join uh, the TA guide for category three on the community assessment uh, that is our already up and live, so you should be able to get a sense of what it will look like uh, by checking out uh, that technical assistance guide if you haven't already. So uh, with that, we are going to jump right in because we do have a, a fair amount of ground to cover this afternoon. So uh, on the agenda, I want to do a brief overview of the technical assistance guide just to let you know how it's structured and give you some tips on how to use it. Um, we'll talk briefly about guidance on conducting uh, the review process, uh, and then we'll jump into a discussion of standards 8.1 through 8.13. So. Uh, we'll focus on uh, both the interpretation of the standards, answering any questions that you might have uh, on uh, how you actually interpret uh, these standards, and again, some of them are more technical than the other standards, and we'll also talk about what documentation uh, that you might have uh, to show that you are in compliance with the standards, and again, we'll take questions after each standard just to make sure that we give everyone uh, time uh, to get through all the questions. So with that, uh, I want to give you a quick overview of the structure for the technical assistance guides. These are similar uh, from guide to guide. And again, there are two primary purposes uh, for all of our technical assistance guides. Um, the first is to assist with uh, the definition, intent, and documentation of the standard. So that is its primary purpose. So uh, in each of the guides, you will see uh, sections A and section B. So what we do in section A, uh, is provide you a little additional background on the standard. So uh, we talk about uh, the definition of the standard, provide any additional contextual detail, because again, some of them do cover fairly technical issues like uh, the audit and a number of financial policies and procedures. Um, talk a little bit more about the intent of the standard, so uh, we explain why it was included in the organizational standards. And then section B covers interpretation and documentation, so uh, we provide additional guidance uh, looking at some questions that have come up uh, commonly about uh, interpreta uh, interpretation of the standard, so we try to anticipate uh, questions that you might have about particular situations and whether the standard would be considered uh, in compliance or not in compliance, and again, we give you some suggestions for uh, documentation, although uh, we make sure that it is uh, clear in the technical assistance guide, your state CSDG lead agency uh, is ultimately the um, entity that will determine what documentation you need to provide for compliance with the standard. So again, we're trying to give you our best guess as to what that documentation may be, so you can get a head start if you're able on uh, putting together that information, but again, your state CSDG lead agency um, should be able to provide you uh, with the final uh, explanation of what documentation uh, you need for uh, your monitoring visit or similar process. Um, the second objective for these guides is to provide you some additional resources to help our agencies go beyond compliance. So in section C in all our guides, uh, we provide you with a series of diagnostic questions uh, that uh, your staff person or team going through the review process can look at um, and do a quick diagnosis of, of not just whether your agency is in compliance with the standard, but how well you're doing uh, around the various management operations um, and other activities related to that standard. 
And in Section D, uh, we provide you some additional resources, both to help you with that uh, assessment, um, but also to help uh, with your work around the activities related to the standard in general. Uh, again, uh, this, the second section uh, going through this uh, evaluation or assessment process is completely voluntary by our agencies. Uh, this is not mandated by the standards. Uh, it's just a, an additional set of capacity building resources that we provide our agencies, although we do encourage uh, the H our agencies uh, to go through and at least do a quick assessment of how you're doing. So to that end, uh, we provide a, in all of our technical assistance guides a quick reference uh, Likert scale on a, uh, that allows you to rate how well your agency is doing on a scale of one to five. So we're encouraging folks, especially in this first year of going through the standards, just to give their organization a quick rating and provide some feedback uh, to your uh, executive team or uh, senior staff uh, around how to improve the agency's operations uh, when it comes to the individual standards. So we're hoping folks take the time to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what type of processes you might use to accomplish that. So uh, some quick considerations for the review process. So again, every guide provides uh, uh, at least an overview of suggestions for how you might conduct the re uh, review process uh, with some additional specific information around each of the categories. So uh, a couple of considerations to take into account as you begin the review process to see if your agencies uh, are in compliance with the standard. Um, I think first a good suggestion is to make sure that the review process for Category 8 is connected to reviews for other standards. Um, we know some agencies are probably going to task one person with collecting the documentation, although uh, we, uh, we're guessing that most will probably divide it up among staff. So especially for Category 8, you're probably going to have your CFO, your controller, uh, or a similar financial staff person uh, collect this documentation. So. Um, it's important when they go through the process uh, that they know the procedure is being used by other staff uh, going through the other categories and make sure that those review processes are connected. Uh, another uh, suggestion is that uh, the agency should look for opportunities to connect the review process into ongoing agency activities. So uh, if you know you're doing a review of your financial processes or procedures, or if you're developing your agency-wide budget, uh, or a similar activity that's going to require a, a broad overview of your agency's finances, that would be a good time to go ahead and incorporate uh, the review process, gathering that documentation you need into it. Uh, it's just simply a little bit more efficient um, than going through a standalone process. So uh, be looking for opportunities to incorporate the review and, and gathering that uh, documentation. Uh, look for opportunities to connect that to existing agency processes. Another suggestion uh, is that you should uh, consider using a team of staff for the review process. So uh, again, uh, we assume some agencies will simply ask one staff person in the appropriate uh, department or office uh, or program uh, to gather the documentation. Um, again, especially for an area that's more technical like finance, uh, if you use a team-based approach, this gives you an opportunity to build overall staff capacity. Um, it's also an opportunity to potentially do some cross-training uh, with uh, non-financial staff, uh, uh, especially for agencies that have smaller finance staff. It's always a good idea to make sure uh, there's another person, whether that's a program staff, somebody in HR, um, someone at the executive level, who's familiar with the basic policies and procedures, knows where the documentation is kept, um, and has some basic familiarity with the financial operations of the organization. Um, in case uh, they're needed to help out, in case the finance person goes on vacation uh, or something else comes up where you would need somebody else uh, with at least a basic background uh, in the financial operations of the organization. So this is a great opportunity to provide another staff person uh, with a big picture overview of the finance side of your agency. Um, we also uh, suggest that uh, if, you, uh, if you are using multiple staff uh, to go through the review process to assess uh, documentation, that you make sure that they're all on the same page in terms of how to assess compliance. So uh, that's one of the purposes of these guides, to make sure that there is uniform guidance uh, around how that process works. Uh, but again, good idea to make sure that uh, the staff who are doing the review, uh, make sure uh, that they have the background on interpretation of the standards and documentation. Thank you. 
Um, also a suggestion that you use a uniform documentation process, especially if you have different staff uh, going through uh, different processes for different categories of standards. Um, it's important to make sure that they're collecting the documentation uh, in, the, in the same place, that there's some coordination going on uh, in terms of how you're managing uh, the, the documents, so make sure that uh, staff understand what that process is. Um, we also suggest but you set up a process for managing those recommendations. So uh, again, you don't have to do a, a full review of your agency's activities, its uh, management and operations around the different categories, uh, but again, we are suggesting that uh, the staff who go through the review process for the standards uh, take a little bit of time uh, to look at how the agency is doing overall and make some recommendations for how you might improve your performance. Um, so again, we're suggesting that agencies set up that process uh, to collect and process those recommendations so you can act on it and again, just improve the performance of your agency uh, around the organizational standards uh, above and beyond simply asking of whether you're in compliance with the standards. Um, and finally, uh, we want to make sure that our agencies use a relatively uniform process for archiving uh, the reviews. So obviously, since this will be an annual process, uh, it's helpful to have a central place to archive those documents. Uh, for many of the standards, um, you can use the same documentation. You don't have to do a, a, a full review or update for two, three, or five years in some cases. Uh, so just making sure that those documents are in the same place. Uh, there's a central filing system and staff know uh, how to access those documents is a good thing, especially since this is the first year many agencies are going through, the, uh, all of our agencies are going through the review process, uh, that will make your life easier in the out years, having uh, a consistent archival system uh, to keep track of all the documentation so you don't have to reinvent the wheel or repeat your efforts in those out years. Uh, our TA guides also provide some suggestions for going through that assessment process. Uh, so again, we're just simply asking in most cases for the staff who do the review um, and documentation of the standards to take um, you know, half an hour, an hour to simply sit, talk to each other, uh, and provide some basic feedback about how they think your agency might improve um, in ways related to the different standards that they're uh, reviewing the documentation for. So some suggestions about how you might do that would include, uh, again, just having a short discussion of strengths that the agency has around that standard and identifying opportunities for improvement. Um, this, uh, we know that going through the standards is going to take a fair amount of time for a lot of agencies, uh, but this can simply be, uh, you know, again, a half-hour conversation uh, among folks uh, who know something about the area that the standard touches on uh, to have a chance to give some feedback about how the agency uh, might improve or do better or build on its strengths uh, in the areas touched on by the standards. Um, another suggestion, which might take a little bit more time, is a review of the resource material. So uh, again, for every standard, uh, that section D uh, contains additional resources that you can use to provide uh, some background support, both for documentation of the standard, but again, also for helping with building overall agency capacity uh, around uh, the management and operations related to, uh, to each standard. Um, another option uh, that might take a little bit more time would be doing interviews or a quick focus group uh, with key staff. Uh, so again, this is a good way to bring all the staff together. You could potentially run through all the standards and get recommendations for how the agency can improve uh, using a staff focus group. So that would be a fairly efficient way uh, to gather that feedback data in addition to just documenting compliance. Um, and lastly, in some cases, an agency might want to uh, hold interviews or do a quick focus group with outside partners uh, and experts. So uh, especially around uh, the agency's financial operations, financial oversight, uh, this might be one uh, set of, uh, of standards where it might be a good idea to get an outside set of eyes or simply review the policies and procedures uh, in place and provide some of those uh, additional recommendations because obviously having a stable uh, financial system, uh, a, a clear set of policies and procedures is incredibly important to the agency's overall stability and fiscal health. So this might be an area that bears uh, a little bit more uh, exploration and examination of, of what's in place, especially if there have been any findings on your audit, um, uh, expansion or contraction of the agency, uh, or anything that changed the way the agency operated significant increases or decreases to your budget.
So uh, with that said, uh, we're looking at the standards in four different groups today. Uh, so instead of going through each individually, one through 13, we've grouped them into four uh, main areas. So the first area we'll look at is the audit, and that's covered by standards 8.1 through 8.5. Um, standards 8.6 and 8.8 .8 have to do with uh, a couple of different governmental requirements. 8.7 and 8.9 uh, cover board oversight of uh, agency finances. And lastly, standards 8.10 through 8.13 cover policies and procedures. So uh, we will organize the standards in those groups, but again, we'll go through each of them uh, one standard at a time and pause for questions at the end of each section. So uh, now we will turn to standards related to the audit, and I will cue Kevin uh, at times during our discussion, uh, again, to provide uh, additional um, levels of detail uh, and answer some of the more technical questions. So standard 8.1, the organization's annual audit or audited financial statements is completed by a certified public accountant on time in accordance with Title II of the Code of Federal Regulations uniform administration requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements, if applicable, and or state audit threshold requirements. So uh, again, starting off with a fairly uh, complex standard. So uh, some quick guidance on assessment, and again, because we have so many standards uh, to go through, we will focus on uh, sections A and B in the TA guides, uh, which provides you, again, that additional context for the standard and guidance on interpretation of the standard and documentation. So we will not cover um, the uh, additional diagnostic questions or the resources, uh, but again, those are included in this technical assistance guide. So guidance on assessment for standard 8.1. Uh, so a couple of things to clarify. Only a licensed CPA can issue an audit, so it's important to make sure whoever does your audit is a CPA. Um, a simple review of transactions is not an audit, and if there are any questions about that, Kevin can answer the difference between uh, a review of transactions and a complete audit. Um, CAAs also need to use a single audit or an A133, not just a financial statements audit. So again, that's a more technical question Kevin can answer um, if there are any questions about the, the difference between those types of, uh, of audits. Um, also, uh, agencies should check for state variance with the uh, federal threshold that requires agencies uh, with expenditures of more than $750,000 to have that A133 audit. So sometimes there are differences in state requirements. Um, also, agencies should check for variance in state and federal reporting format. Sometimes uh, the state uh, reporting format uh, has some differences with the federal reporting format. Um, Auditees must also send a summary report to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, so an important step in the overall audit procedure. And audit submission deadlines are nine months after the end of the fiscal year. So uh, again, one of the things that's com a little bit more complicated about standards in Category 8 um, is that they deal with things that uh, they deal with um, fiscal uh, activities, policies, and procedures that also have uh, additional requirements. So, in addition to conducting the audit, there are certain requirements about the way the audit is conducted, um, certain other deadlines uh, that aren't necessarily mentioned by the standards that you need to make sure you're aware of uh, in order for, in, in order to uh, to meet the standard. So, as a general rule, I think it's a good idea to make sure that you start work on this category. Um, as early as possible uh, because, uh, and we'll call out some of the standards that might take a little bit more time than usual um, to get in compliance with if you're not in compliance with. Uh, so again, a good idea to get started on Category 8 as soon as possible because uh, you might uh, have to do some uh, additional work to get in compliance with the standards uh, if you're not already in compliance. So Kasia, next slide. So guidance on documentation. So uh, a physical or electronic copy of the audit report and related information uh, would be one document. And you would also need an electronic receipt from the Federal Clearinghouse showing the date the audit report was submitted um, and that it was within that nine-month deadline uh, or else uh, it does not count. Uh, 
and uh, or a letter or other correspondence from a state agency acknowledging receipt of the audit and related information within the nine-month deadline or earlier if, it, if the deadline is earlier as required by the state. So, uh, again, complicated language in this standard, but relatively straightforward uh, documentation. Uh, but again, the audit process is obviously, uh, you know, a, a fairly complex and involved process, so you would need to get through that process in order to comply with the standard. So, uh, I want to open it up for any questions now um, and any additional detail that uh, Kevin might want to supply that I've missed. No, this is Kevin. I think you're you're right on point here. I think you know the one thing to emphasize is the you know everyone is pretty much aware of the federal requirements, but sometimes those state requirements are different, and we just have to make sure that whatever state we're operating in, we make sure that we comply with with the with the requisite state requirements, not just the federal requirements. Great. And, and Kevin, are there any um, common mistakes or, or oversights that you sometimes see agencies make uh, around the audit um, that might uh, catch them when they go to try to comply with the, with the standard? So, uh, you know, paperwork issues, again, that deadline I think is also really important, but um, any common uh, issues that you see with audits that, that might trip an agency up as it uh, tries to get in compliance with the standard? Yeah, that's a great point. I think, you know, a lot of times it's, it, I think, you know, most of us are familiar with, with getting everything finalized in the audit process, but just receiving the audit report is not the conclusion of that process. We have to make sure we submit it to the clearinghouse and within that nine-month time frame as well, and um, that's really the only point that, that the process is actually complete. Once we've submitted the, the audit report to the clearinghouse uh, electronically, as well as any of the state funders that we may have. So we have to make sure that we close that loop and communicate the audit report out once we're done with the process. Right, and that's, a, that's an important uh, distinction. And again, uh, a good example of one of those things that you should probably check on and why you should uh, start working on uh, getting documentation together uh, for this particular standard because there are some things that take a little uh, additional time. So do we have any questions on standard 8.1? I don't see any that have come in yet, but I do want to remind everybody that um, since you are listening through your computer speakers, um, you do have to type in your questions, so if you could please use that Q&A box on your right side panel. And uh, if we miss one, hopefully we'll be able to circle back around since there are a few that are related to the audit. Great. All right, so on to standard 8.2, all findings from the prior year's annual audit have been assessed by the organization and addressed where the governing board has deemed it appropriate. So uh, a two-part standard, so making sure that you've assessed any findings um, and that the board uh, has taken action if necessary. So uh, guidance on the uh, assessment of this particular standard, a uh, couple questions. Uh, Make sure that uh, you know uh, whether the audit contained any findings or questions cost. Uh, obviously, that's the, the purpose of this, audit, uh, of this particular standard, uh, to make sure that if there are any findings, the agency has followed up and taken action. Um, another important question to ask uh, is that were the corrective action plan submitted to the appropriate audit oversight entity? Um, so making sure that there's that uh, you're following through on the, uh, the oversight process with corrective action plans. Um, again, if a corrective action plan was required, uh, was it adequate to solve the identified issues? So making sure that there's not just a corrective action plan in place, but it's actually taking care of whatever the finding was. Um, and then lastly, making sure that whatever finding uh, uh, or findings were included in the audit, that they were actually legitimate findings. So uh, you can challenge a finding uh, in, in an audit, so it's important not just simply uh, to accept all findings on, on face value, to do a careful review of those findings, uh, especially if you think there might be cause uh, to challenge any of them. So guidance on documentation for standard 8.2. Um, so uh, you need two sets of documentations. In, and again, this uh, standard only applies in the case of uh, an audit that produced a finding. So if your audit did have a finding, 
Um, you need documentation confirming the agency's response uh, to that finding, and that would simply be uh, a physical or electronic copy of the corrective action plan or plans that have been prepared in response uh, to the audit findings. Uh, so that's relatively straightforward. And the second thing you would need is documentation that the agency has reviewed its correction, uh, corrective action plan with the board, and that could simply be highlighted copies of the official minutes of the meetings of the board, indicating the response by management to the audit findings, and indicating the board's acceptance of its corrective action plan. So uh, again, a two-part uh, set of documents you will need if your audit had a finding. So, Kevin, anything else to add? And then we'll take any questions on 8.2. Um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, make sure you go through that audit report, pull out any of the findings that are in there, take the necessary action to correct that, those findings through whatever the appropriate state process is in your particular state, and get that resolved before the next audit. The, the surprise that some agencies have is, that if you have a finding one year that's not corrected by the time the audit is conducted next year, then you in essence have two findings, one being the original finding and the second finding being the fact that you haven't resolved the finding. So it's very important that, that you get on any of those findings right away and get them cleared up as soon as you possibly can. And uh, again, this is a, a good standard to flag in terms of timing because uh, you want to make sure that you know when you're going to be monitored by your lead agency uh, against this particular standard um, and figure out when your next audit um, is scheduled for because uh, obviously you might be in a situation where you have a finding um, that has not been reviewed by the board but you're being audited in the interim. Uh, so again, good to make sure that you've got the sequence uh, clear and know how much time you have between the audit um, and when you will be uh, monitored by your, your state agency uh, to make sure there's enough time to respond to any, uh, to any findings um, or potentially alert your, uh, your state lead agency um, that the audit has been conducted. There are findings that the board has not been able uh, to review the corrective action plan yet. So, uh, so again, uh, a good standard that illustrates the importance of making sure your, your ducks are in a row as early as possible. Right, so any questions on 8.2 before we move on? Not yet. All right. So standard 8.3, the organization's auditor presents the audit to the governing board. So uh, again, a relatively straightforward standard. So uh, some guidance on uh, assessment, the presentation to uh, an audit committee does not count as presentation to the board. So uh, this is one of those questions that, that we've had sometimes that might trip an agency up. Um, you need to present uh, the audit to the full board, not just uh, the audit committee or uh, the, the fiscal or finance uh, committee uh, of your board. It needs to go to the board as a whole. And also, uh, the auditor must conduct uh, the presentation. Again, that's standard practice for the auditor to, uh, to present the audit to the board, uh, but there might be uh, some cases where uh, the auditor themselves is not presenting that, uh, presenting that information. It's important that the auditor does this so that there is an opportunity for the board to ask questions um, and deal with any issues that have come up uh, in the findings. So for documentation, uh, you would need to have uh, two sets of documentation for this particular standard. So document, uh, documentation evidencing the discussion uh, with the auditors actually took place. So that would be uh, an agenda of the governing board with that particular item, uh, minutes from the governing board meeting with highlights of the discussion. So anything that would, any documentation that would indicate uh, that, that, presentation, uh, that presentation took place. Um, and ideally, documentation of the content of that discussion. So uh, a printed or electronic copy of the PowerPoint or similar type of presentation that was made to the board, uh, or copies of handouts or other printed media uh, presented to the board. So you would want to have both documentation that the presentation was made um, and also documentation of the content uh, of that presentation, ideally. So any questions about 8.3? And Kevin, anything else uh, to add? No, I think the, that standard is probably one of the one of the more simple standards that we that we have. Pretty straightforward. Okay, great. 
and questions looks like everybody's shy, but a reminder that you can put those in, and we will circle back and get as many of them in as we can. Great. All right, so standard 8.4, the governing board formally receives and accepts the audit. Again, relatively straightforward. Um, so guidance on assessment. Uh, so again, important to stress that all board members must receive the audit. So again, presenting it to a subcommittee or committee of the, uh, of the board uh, would not meet the standard. And also important to note that the board must use a formal motion or similar process to accept the audit. So simply presenting the audit findings uh, to, the, to the board uh, by the auditor, uh, while that is required obviously by standard 8.3, the board must formally accept uh, the, uh, the results of the audit. So making sure that there is a formal uh, motion or similar process uh, is important to meeting this particular standard. So guidance on documentation. Uh, you would need uh, documentation, again, two types, board receipt of the audit, so uh, emails with confirmation of the receipt uh, or board acknowledgement of uh, the receipt of the audit in the minutes. So you could uh, just simply add to your emails the, uh, the recipients uh, sending their, their um, uh, confirmation that they have received uh, the particular audit. Uh, or maybe slightly easier, just simply notes in the, the board minute that the board has re formally received the audit. And then the second type of documentation, uh, again, is that board acceptance of the audit, and that could be documented simply with, uh, with board minutes um, indicating that there was a formal motion by the board to accept the audit. So again, Kevin, anything to add or any questions from the group? Again, I think this is a pretty straightforward uh, uh, standard here. I think different community action agencies have different uh, committee structures and some have audit committees and, and others don't. Um, you know, certainly this is not meant to override the importance of the work that's done at the committee level, but rather the full board has the responsibility for oversight and its fiduciary responsibilities related to finance. And so even if the audit committee of the board does some of the heavy lifting in terms of plowing through the report page by page, it is still important that the full board be made aware of the, the fact that an audit was conducted and what the findings were in that audit. So just to make sure that, that the full board has some in level of involvement in the audit process, even if, even if it does go through a committee structure. Great, and we have our first question. Um, our board receives the audit in different ways. Some want hard copies, some want PDFs, uh, some want to be able to review in our website. Do we need to document receipt for each and every board member? Um, our reading of the standard is that um, yes, you do need to document receipt of the audit uh, by the board. Uh, again, uh, if, if the board members want the audit delivered in different ways, I think the easiest way to satisfy the standard um, is simply before the board uh, makes the motion to formally accept the audit, uh, you just simply add in there uh, that everyone on the board is, has received uh, the audit or had a chance uh, to, to look at it. That can be confirmed in the minutes then along with the board's uh, official acceptance. So I think it's probably easier to confirm that everybody on the board has received the audit on the back end of that process instead of uh, tracking down, you know, potentially dozens of emails from each board member saying that they formally received the audit or, or written uh, affirmation. I think it's probably easiest to roll that into the board's formal acceptance. So you would just simply ask them, has the board received the audit? Uh, the minutes uh, record the board says yes. Does the board formally receive the audit, uh, formally approve the audit? Board minutes reflect that the board has, uh, uh, has uh, uh, approved the audit, um, and you would satisfy that. So uh, I, I would encourage you not to, to do it by tracking down each individual board member, but yes, each board member does need to receive a, a copy of the audit to meet this standard is our, under, is our interpretation. All right, any additional questions on 8.1 through 8.4? At this point. All right. So 8.5, the last audit standard. Uh, so the organization has solicited bids for its audit within the past five years. So guidance uh, on assessment of the standard, uh, just to clarify a few things. Um, the standard does not require that the agency has to change auditors every five years. 
Um, again, informal solicitation of bids does not satisfy the standard. You need to have a formal solicitation for bids. And soliciting a bid from the current auditor alone does not satisfy uh, this particular standard. So again, a couple of questions that we've gotten from other agencies, you need to have a general solicitation of bids uh, from multiple auditors. So at least uh, ideally an open solicitation from all the, uh, uh, from a, a larger list of, of auditors, but again, just simply soliciting a bid from your current auditor uh, or informally soliciting bids would not meet the standard. Um, guidance on the documentation for the standard uh, could include a copy of the organization's uh, procurement policy, uh, a copy of the request for proposals prepared by the agency and submitted to potential providers of audit services, um, responses from the replying CPA firms to the request for proposals, um, and or a scoring grid or evaluation sheet by, and by the entity's personnel responsible for uh, the review of proposals. So again, a, a couple of different options, uh, but probably the most straightforward would simply be that copy of the request for proposals uh, prepared by the agency and submitted to those potential providers of audit services. So that would indeed uh, satisfy uh, the standard. So, Kevin, um, anything uh, to, to add to this? And, and one question we've heard in the past is, uh, you know, what about agencies that are in rural areas where there might not be, you know, a large concentration of auditors? What might be a way for, for an agency to meet the standard uh, if it's simply not familiar with, with many other auditors in the area? Sure. So, the, the new uniform guidance provides the standards on how proposals should be evaluated from potential auditors, what types of things should be looked at, including cost and past experience and, and peer review results. So the new guidance gives, gives that type of, of uh, oversight from, from OMB. Of course, the, the age-old question of, you know, how often should I change auditors? Should I rotate partners on the audit? Um, there's nothing in the OMB guidance that, that gives specific requirements for that. So the organizational standards now in terms of actually going through the procurement process every five years is a standard above what the OMB uh, requirements mandate. In terms of maximizing your competition and maximizing participation in that, that process, you know, we hear all the time different, different states have different um, numbers of, of CPA firms that have expertise in this area. Some states have a lot of firms that specialize in single audits. Some states have, have little emphasis. I think there's a number of, of national firms or large regional firms that are willing to travel to do the work. So the days of the, the CPA firm having to be the, the firm down at the corner block are long since gone. And there are many large uh, CPA firms that are willing to to travel across state lines um, to, to, do, to do the work, and it's a matter of making sure that you, you get a hold of those and get those folks involved in that procurement process on the front side. Doesn't mean you have to select them, of course, but it, uh, I think it it's, would be pretty hard to say nowadays that, that there's, there's only one CPA that would, would be willing to do my audit. Great, and any additional questions uh, from the group? All right, so on to our next set of standards, so standards related to government requirements. So this is 8.6 and 8.8. .8. We're going slightly out of order here. So for standard 8.6, the IRS Form 990 is completed annually and made available to the governing board for review. So general guidance uh, on the assessment of this standard, um, forms filed by the extended deadline still qualify as timely. So if you've asked for uh, an extension or filed by that extended deadline, um, that will still qualify you as timely. So an important thing to make sure that you clarify with your, uh, with your state lead agency if there are any questions about this. Um, and again, review by a board uh, committee or subcommittee uh, does not meet the standard. So uh, again, just like the, uh, the audit standards uh, that we discussed, this would need to, uh, the 990 would need to be made available uh, to the board as a whole. So guidance on documentation. 
Um, so again, two sets of documentations uh, that you need for this standard. Uh, documentation that confirms the agency has prepared Form 990, so that would be um, a physical or electronic copy of 990 um, and a related state form if uh, any are required. And the second type of documentation uh, would be that which confirms the agency has made the form available for board review. So again, a board agenda, a board meeting packet or meeting minutes or an email to board members uh, with the required form uh, attached. So, uh, again, this is a slightly less strict standard. You don't need to actually discuss the Form 990. You just need to make it available uh, to your board. So uh, I would think an email would be the, uh, the easiest way to do that. Um, also, a common suggestion is that um, nonprofits should have the 990 available on their website uh, just to make their finances more transparent as publicly funded entities. Um, so that would be uh, an easy way to meet the standard, uh, simply making uh, the form available on the website and sending a link to uh, your board members. So, Kevin, anything to add uh, around the 990? The only thing I would add here is there's actually a question on the 990 on whether the board has reviewed the 990 before submittal which is, is actually a kind of a higher standard than the org standard in terms of making it available for review. So, um, you, you know, that's one of those questions where we all know what the right answer on the 990 is, and we want to make sure that we, we do the process that's necessary to be able to check the correct box. And so um, the, the correct answer, of course, is that, yes, we want to be able to say the, the board has reviewed the 990 before it was submitted, and if we have met that standard, then we've kind of automatically met the org standard related to the 990. Great. And again, you know, Kevin brings up a very important point that the uniform guidance does um, often have additional requirements uh, for a number of the, uh, the activities and uh, procedures uh, related to uh, the audits in, or the, uh, the standards in this particular category. Um, so uh, again, this is a category that obviously it's important to meet the standard, but you also need to be familiar uh, with the uniform guidance requirements as well. Um, those are covered, uh, at least in brief, in our technical assistance guide, uh, but also why you probably want to make sure that you are uh, moving forward on gathering the documentation for this standard, um, especially in this first year and with the release of that new uniform guidance, the, the super circular, um, simply because it's, it's new and you want to make sure that you give yourself enough time to get your ducks in a row in case any, you encounter um, any snags. So uh, again, uh, I think the, this particular standard is relatively straightforward, but we'll get to a couple that are a little bit more complex in a second. All right, standard 8.8. .8. All required filings and payments related to payroll withholdings are completed on time. So uh, some guidance on the assessment of this standard. Um, the agency must comply with all state and federal filings and payments, so making sure you're in compliance both with, uh, with state and federal uh, requirements. And partial or late filings, even if ultimately completed, uh, do not meet this standard. Right, so it's important that uh, the filings uh, occur on time, um, and so that is something that would have to be uh, addressed with your state uh, CSBG lead agency uh, if any of those uh, payments or filings are late. So guidance on documentation uh, would include payroll tax returns, copies of checks or other documentation showing the amounts due were actually paid, uh, retirement plan documentations, submittal reforms to the retirement plan, uh, flexible health spending or other similar plan documents, and required flexible health spending or other similar plan document submittal forms. So um, this is a standard that requires uh, a larger number of, uh, of uh, forms for, uh, for documentation. So again, another reason uh, to make sure that you've gathered those forms uh, as early as possible. So Kevin, anything to add or any challenges or, or places where you've seen agencies uh, trip up around payroll? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, payroll is one of those big things that, that there's an actual liability, a potential liability back to the board members if the, if the tax deposits aren't made. It's also kind of one of those first or early warning signs that, a, that an agency may be in trouble if they're not making their, their payroll tax deposits on time. 
it's so important to remember the concept that when we get withholdings from employees' paychecks, those, those withholdings are not a resource of the agency. They are the, a federal or a state government resource, and it's important that we get those submitted in a, in a timely manner. Um, so we've got federal requirements, you have state requirements, you may have local requirements in certain places with, with certain uh, payroll tax re uh, related reports and, and forms. And it's absolutely essential that you know what those are and that you meet all of those deadlines. It, uh, it puts an agency in jeopardy if everything is not filed in a timely manner and any type of impound funds are not uh, transferred within a, a timely manner as well. Absolutely essential function. Great, and even though it's not required by the standard, if there uh, has been a, a late filing or similar issue, uh, that would mean you are out of compliance. Uh, my guess is you should probably, as an agency, go ahead and put together a corrective action plan or, or similar approach proactively uh, before you're monitored by your lead agency uh, so you can show them what action has been taken uh, to make sure that you will be in compliance with that standard in the future um, and, and to uh, avoid any uh, potential challenges that might come with, uh, with additional monitoring that that lead agency conducts. Right, Absolutely. So any questions? Yes, thanks, Kevin. So any, any questions on this one? None that have come in so far. All right. So standards related to board oversight, those are 8.7 and 8.9. So standard 8.7, the governing board receives financial reports at each regular meeting. Uh, that include the following. The first is an organization-wide report on revenue and expenditures that compares budget to actual, categorized by program, and two, balance sheet uh, or statement of financial positions. So guidance on the uh, assessment. Uh, the board must receive both the budget versus actuals for revenues and expenditures and the balance sheet or statements of financial positions. So this is not an either or standard. The board must receive both of those documents. Um, uh, second is a clarification. So the board does not have to receive these reports at special meetings. So for example, if you do a strategic planning retreat, although while you should probably have that information there, um, you do not have to do an independent uh, re report out of that information, but at all regular meetings of the board, you will need to present these documents. Um, and make up reports at subsequent board meetings does not meet the standard uh, if one or both reports was not presented at a previous meeting. So while that would be good practice, uh, and you should definitely do that make up report, you will not be in compliance uh, with this particular standard. So you need to make sure that there is a clear process and procedure in place uh, for providing your board with this information at every regular uh, board meeting, uh, excluding special meetings that, that would not normally be in your, your board meeting cycle. So guidance on documentation, you could have a board agenda showing that those reports were included, a board meeting packet with required reports, uh, including board minutes, uh, email to board members with the required reports attached, uh, or a physical log with board signatures attesting to the fact that they had received uh, the forms. Probably board minutes are the easiest way to do that, but again, you need to provide this information, um, both reports at every regularly scheduled board meeting. Uh, so uh, we do have a, uh, so Kevin, uh, we've got a question, but anything to add before we, uh, before we take the question? No, nothing to add. Okay. Um, so uh, question is, can this standard be complied with via copies of, uh, oh, so this is for standard 8.6? or 8.8, uh, can the standard be complied with uh, via copies of bank statements showing clear payments made uh, to pension providers, state and federal taxes, uh, et cetera? Um, so my, my qualified answer uh, would, would be yes. So the question on uh, uh, payroll uh, 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 filings, uh, but again, that's something to check with your uh, state lead agency. So the model state plans uh, should have come out uh, so the, your state lead agencies should be, uh, if they have not already provided you guidance on what documentation uh, 
um, is required to meet these standards? Uh, I think that's a good question uh, to ask them because, again, they are the final arbiters of what counts as documentation. Um, but my interpretation of the standard would be those, those, um, uh, those documents would, uh, would, would count as, as meeting that particular standard. Um, we have another question. Um, how do you have budget to actual for a balance sheet? I understand for uh, the revenue and expenditures report. So, Kevin, how would you, uh, that might be one that you could take. How do you have a budget to yeah, actual budget, for a balance sheet? You don't. Budget to actual refers to the income statement. It doesn't refer to the balance sheet. Okay. Great, so any other questions on 8.7? Not yet. Okay. Standard 8.9, the governing board annually approves an organization-wide budget. So guidance for assessment on this particular standard, uh, a board review of the budget without formal approval does not meet the standard. So uh, again, it's not just okay for your board to review the budget, it actually needs to review, or it actually needs to formally approve the budget. So again, making a motion to uh, formally uh, accept or approve that agency-wide budget. And also, review of individual program budgets does not meet the standard. So even if you did a comprehensive review where you looked at the budgets for each of your programs, um, that would not count. Now, obviously, there's another standard that requires you to have an agency-wide budget. This is a standard that says the board must review and approve that particular budget, um, but that would not count if you did a program-by-program -program, uh, uh, review um, in lieu of having an agency-wide budget. So guidance on documentation could take a number of forms, uh, a copy of the approved agency-wide budget, a copy of the budget presentation from the board meeting, so either handouts or a PowerPoint, um, a board agenda, noting that the uh, agency-wide budget had been presented and approved, or minutes of the board meeting uh, with the actual approval action indicated by the board. So again, important that the board takes formal action uh, to approve that agency-wide budget. So, Kevin, anything uh, to add about uh, this particular standard? Um, I think this is one of those areas where I think all or just about all agencies are, are approving their, their budgets at a minimum on a grant-by-grant -grant basis. Um, this standard really takes it one level higher than that and makes it essential to be in compliance that we approve an agency-wide budget. And I would just mention that there's uh, a toolkit that's available on the Community Action Partnerships website that talks about the importance and applicability of doing an agency-wide budget versus doing just a program-by-program program based budget. And there's a, there's a significant advantage that accrues by doing that, that you're looking at how you're covering those indirect costs on an agency-wide level as opposed to just how are you meeting the spending uh, requirements for that particular grant. Great, and so any questions uh, from the group about this particular standard or since we're on the topic, uh, questions about the agency-wide budget as a whole? Uh, we have a question, does the uh, standard require the approval prior to the start of the fiscal year? Um, uh, again, this is definitely a question that you should ask your state CSBG lead agency. Um, I would assume that uh, the agency-wide uh, budget would need to be uh, approved for the current fiscal year uh, that, that you are in. So we know some agencies don't have agency-wide budgets. Uh, so uh, I think what this question gets to is a, a sequencing issue. So if you don't have your agency-wide budget yet in place, but you're uh, monitored uh, against this particular standard before that budget has been created because you don't have it from the previous year or that was not something that you regularly did, um, I think in those particular cases, the first thing uh, the, the monitor will look for um, is progress towards meeting the standard. So um, if you can point to a process that is in place uh, to develop that agency-wide budget, 
uh, I think that would be helpful. Again, uh, uh, state agencies have been um, guided by OCS uh, to consider progress towards meeting the standard uh, as what they look to. So if you're in the process of creating an agency-wide budget, um, I think that would be, uh, I, I think that would be sort of the ideal situation if you don't already have one in place. Um, but my assumption is that you are approving that agency-wide budget, um, especially in this first year of operations for your, your current fiscal year. So, Kevin, any other uh, guidance on that particular issue? Um, no, certainly it would make sense that your budget's approved before, before the year starts, but I, I don't know that there's any specific requirement that, that mandates that sort of other than common sense, I guess. Right. Sure, and as someone who was um, part of all of the discussions to uh, work on this standard, yeah, it is kind of hoped, implied, um, even within the standard, but it is not written into it um, for that very problem of, of timing. Um, just for example, the partnership itself, um, we're calendar year, but our first board meeting isn't until mid-January, and we don't actually have um, enough information at the previous board meeting. So instead of trying to call a special meeting uh, to try to work on our budget, we accept the fact that it's not technically going to be done on January 1, it's probably going to be done on January 10, and that shouldn't be out of compliance. So it's, it's that acceptance of uh, different timing issues that you may have either with when the fiscal year ends, when you're monitored, or uh, when the board meetings actually are. Great, and again, we would uh, strongly suggest um, agencies uh, that think there might be a, an issue around this or a similar standard where those timing issues are in play, uh, to simply reach out to uh, your, your state lead agency to clarify what their requirement is, um, and also note um, any potential uh, issues uh, around this and what the agency is doing uh, to address that particular issue. I think it's good to be proactive in these cases, make sure there's a clear uh, flow and exchange of information, um, and then you can move forward um, without it being a surprise when you are formally monitored against the standard. All right, so our last set of standards, the standards related to policies and procedures, those are 8.10 through 8.13, and these are a, a number of these standards uh, cover um, uh, issues uh, around financial policies and procedures that have additional requirements that aren't called out in the standards but are required by the, uh, the uniform guidance, so we'll go into a little bit more detail about a couple of these standards. All right, so standard uh, 8.10. The fiscal policies have been reviewed by staff within the past two years, updated as necessary, with changes approved by the governing board. So uh, guidance on the assessment, and this is one I'll turn it over uh, to Kevin. Um, so the uniform um, administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for federal award, uh, rewards um, require a number of uh, written procedures, which are listed on the, sw uh, on the slide. Um, they'll also be uh, obviously discussed in the technical uh, assistance guide. But Kevin, anything to add for, uh, uh, for these particular requirements? Um, no, I think, you know, this is, you know, we, we all hopefully have good uh, written policies and procedures and certainly meeting these minimum requirements that are included in the uniform guidance that are listed on the slide you see in front of you are, you know, those are the ones that are re required to be in compliance with the federal standards. Um, you would certainly have additional uh, policies and procedures that, that your organization has in addition to the, you know, eight or nine that are listed here. Um, but, and so this is not meant to be an all-inclusive list by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, again, I think a good example of a, of a standard where there are additional requirements that an agency needs to be aware of, um, not just the standard, but also those called out um, in those, uh, the, the uniform guidance. So uh, again, we provide some additional background 
uh, in our technical assistance guide, um, but this is something that uh, you should, again, another reason why you want to make sure that your uh, your ducks in a row with some of these uh, particular standards, um, because you might have a case where you are in compliance with the organizational standard, but your monitor or during the monitoring visit it comes up that you're not in compliance um, with the uniform guidance with the the super circular, which may raise other issues uh, with the state lead agency. So guidance on uh, interpreting the standards. So um, in-process review of policies should count towards meeting the standards. So uh, again, uh, if for whatever reason, uh, when you are monitored, you are still reviewing uh, your fiscal policies, um, our understanding is that should count towards meeting the standards. Um, or at least it should be a situation where the agency is able to clarify what that process is um, with their monitor and the state lead agency um, and simply do a quick follow-up to confirm that review has taken place. Uh, so again, for some of these uh, standards where you might be in review, that is, that is our understanding, that as long as you are in process or have a plan in place that can be uh, confirmed um, uh, by the end of the, uh, the monitoring cycle, um, you should be uh, in compliance or at least you should be able to arrange uh, an MOU with your monitor in the state lead agency so your agency can, can be in compliance without having a formal technical assistance plan. Um, also, a partial review of fiscal policies does not meet the standards, so um, I, uh, I think best practices would be to have all your fiscal policies in a single manual. Um, if for whatever reason that is not the case, you need to make sure that you've reviewed all of those fiscal policies. Um, also, a review of policies without board approval of the changes does not meet the standard. So, again, once you've reviewed your fiscal policies, if there are any changes that need to be made, those need to be formally approved by the board. And a review of changes to fiscal policies by a board committee does not meet the standard. So, once again, any changes to those fiscal policies um, would need to be uh, uh, reviewed by uh, the whole board, not just a, a finance committee or a, a similar board structure. So, gu uh, guidance on documentation. So, documentation of fiscal policies would simply be a copy of your fiscal policy manual. Um, you would also need to document that the staff review has taken place, and so that might be minutes from the staff committee charged with reviewing the policies, um, a policies document with suggested changes and red lines throughout, so a physical copy showing what changes have been suggested or made, um, or a policy manual uh, with a review date indicated on the document cover, so showing that that uh, review process has taken place. And then if the board um, has approved any uh, updates, you uh, could show that through uh, board agenda, board minutes, or a board packet uh, with policies attached. So, Kevin, anything to add on this one um, and any questions from the group? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, I think the you know, once again fairly fairly straightforward here, and you know we're not trying to get into all the details of what would be in a policy manual, but uh, the fact that the, there is a process in place to review and update is really is really what the org standard is looking for here. Great. I think we have a question. No. Nope. No. No question. All right, so moving on to 8.11. A written procurement policy is in place and has been reviewed by the governing board within the past five years. So again, this is one uh, where I will turn it over to Kevin because uh, the uniform uh, requirements does have uh, some specification. So Kevin, anything specific to call out here? Yeah, I don't really wanna you know, get us go down the rabbit hole too deep here and, and talk about the procurement policy. Um, you know, we could talk uh, for an hour and a half at least about, about procurement policies, and I'm sure that would put everyone asleep. I'm, um, but the, the uniform guidance is, is really pretty clear on what the, the minimum standards are from a, from a federal policy standard related to, to procurement. So you can see some of the highlights that are on the, this slide, I think, in the, the next slide or two related to procurement, um, I would you know, urge you to, to examine that maybe when, when you have a little more time to, to dig into the detail. 
The other thing I would make sure that I want to point out here is these are the federal standards that are in place uh, for the uniform guidance. Most, the vast majority of our CSBG money goes from the feds to the state and then from the state to our community action agencies. And when that money passes through the hands of the state, um, the state can attach their requirements for procurement as well. So it is important that when our agencies write procurement policies that are specific for that in their individual organization, that they don't look just at the federal standards, but they also keep in mind what those state standards are. And if those uh, standards at the state are more restrictive, their policy that they use for their agency must be the, the more restrictive of the federal or state um, uh, requirements. So just make sure that you don't just follow the, the federal standards or that you don't use a template for a procurement policy um, off some national website and then find out that your particular state has re requirements that are more stringent and you end up uh, writing a good policy uh, but only if you were located in a different state. <laughs> Good point, Kevin. And again, uh, an example of a standard where uh, you might run into a situation where your agency is in compliance with the organizational standard, uh, but potentially you're not in compliance um, with the super circular. So uh, again, uh, uh, that may bring up other uh, issues uh, when you are monitored, because we're assuming a lot of uh, state lead agencies will conduct their regular monitoring um, in conjunction with monitoring against the organizational standards. Uh, so so again, that's a, that's a good one to make sure you're in compliance, not just with the organizational standards, but with the super circular as well. All right, so uh, guidance on the assessment of this standard. So again, in process review. So if you're in process uh, of reviewing the policy, still should count towards meeting that standard. And again, as Kevin pointed out, your procurement policy uh, should meet both federal and state requirements. Um, Again, a review of changes by a board committee does not meet this requirement, so you would need that full board uh, to review those changes. And incorporation of a procurement policy into a fiscal policies manual does meet the standard. So you do not necessarily need a standalone procurement policy. In fact, uh, most fiscal policies have the procurement policy uh, within them as a subsection, so it's perfectly okay um, to have within your fiscal policies uh, that procurement policy. You don't need that, that standalone document. And uh, guidance on documentation of Standard 8.11. So uh, you would need, obviously, a copy of your procurement policy. And if there have been any changes as a result of, of uh, the review of the procurement policy, um, you, could, uh, the, you would need board documentation that they've reviewed those changes. And that would include, again, simply a board agenda, board minutes, uh, or a board packet uh, with the procurement policy uh, attached. So again, relatively uh, straightforward, uh, I think, in terms of documentation. But again, the, the trick is making sure um, that you're also in compliance with uh, the, the super circular in addition to the organizational standards. All right, so any additional questions here? We have one that just popped up. Oh, technical issue. Cashin, uh, if you're having any audio issues, Cashin is on it. All right, so moving forward to 8.12, um, the organization documents how it allocates shared costs through an indirect cost rate or through a written cost allocation plan. And again, this is one that I will uh, turn over to Kevin in a second as soon as we get that uh, slide because there are a number of options uh, to handle indirect costs. So Kevin, maybe if you could give us the view from uh, 30,000 feet on these options. Sure, the new uniform guidance really allows three methods for recovery of indirect costs. Uh, some organizations are using cost allocation, so they allocate out all of their costs to the different programs. The uniform guidance creates a new form of creating uh, indirect cost recovery, and that's called the de minimis indirect rate. That is where organizations can use a 10% of modified total direct costs. Uh, and that, has a, that term has a very specific definition as an indirect rate. And then, of course, we continue to have the negotiated indirect cost rates that, that exist, and there's, there's three different types of, of indirect 
negotiated indirect cost rates as well. Um, your organization has to uh, choose one of the, the three options. There's a whole bunch of, of different criteria that your organization would want to go through. Uh, once again, I would reference the, the Community Action Partnerships website has a number of toolkits, both on cost allocation and on indirect cost rates. Um, there's some decisions that you need to make. There's kind of no no way that that we as a, the, uh, the community action partnership can give you a recommendation to tell you which is the the best type of indirect cost rate or cost recovery. You'd have to go through that analysis on your own to to figure that out um, and make that decision. But what the organizational standards require is that you have a very clear, documented, uh, systemic way to recover those indirect costs. And recovering those are so crucial to the financial health of, of your organization um, that the org standards found it compelling to, in, to include that as a, as a requirement. So many uh, requirements, once again, you know, we, could, we could spend a whole day talking about indirect cost rates, um, but the, the key here is that your organization has gone through that process and, and made whatever decision you have deemed is the, the best decision for your particular organization. Great, so thanks Kevin for that uh, clarification and on to uh, guidance for the uh, interpretation of the standard. So uh, again, in process negotiations with the federally cognizant agency uh, responsible for uh, indirect uh, rate approval should meet the standard. So again, if you're in negotiation around your indirect rate, that should be one of those instances uh, where all you need to do is to have an MOU or a simple follow-up uh, with your monitor and the, and the, the state lead agency once uh, they have been concluded uh, in order to meet the standard. Um, also, agencies must have the final letter of approval for their indirect cost rate from the cognizant agency to comply with the standard. So if you're caught in that situation where you know your indirect rate has been approved but you can't find that letter, uh, you should probably uh, find it because you will, you will need it uh, to meet the standard to show, in fact, that uh, that rate has been improved. And if the agency uses a cost allocation plan, uh, you need documentation uh, whether the plan must be uh, approved or not. And on to uh, suggestions for documentation. So um, if a negotiated federal cost rate is selected, the entity should have an approval letter from the cognizant agency responsible uh, to negotiate the rate with the entity, so you would need that letter. Uh, again, if a cost allocation is used, the entity should have an updated cost allocation policy document laying out the methodology used for accounting indirect costs. And if the entity is using the de minimis indirect cost rate, this should be indicated on the grant forms received from the funding agency. So you would need different documentation uh, depending on the method that you use. So Kevin, anything to add here and any questions from the audience? Um, I, I don't have anything to add, but I'm more than happy to take questions. And again, slightly more complicated in terms of documentation since you would need uh, different forms of documentation depending on uh, which method you use. But uh, again, otherwise I think relatively straightforward. All right, so if there are no questions, uh, we will conclude with our last standard. So standard 8.13, the organization has a written policy in place for record retention and destruction. So uh, again, some quick uh, overall guidance. Um, I, uh, IRS Form 990 asks, did the organization have a written document retention and destruction policy? And federal grants require that supporting information on the grant, including the financial detail, be maintained for three years from the submission date of the final report of the grant. So uh, again, another instance where um, you need to meet that uh, additional requirement uh, in your 990 um, in addition to the, the organizational standard, which does not say how long uh, you need to retain those, those documents. So uh, again, uh, an important technical point to, to, uh, to note. And uh, again, if we could advance the slide. So guidance on the assessment of the standard. So uh, once again, in-process reviews of policies should count towards meeting the standard. So if you are in the process of reviewing your document uh, retention and destruction policy, uh, like those similar issues we've noted before, that should count towards meeting the standard. Um, 
the policy needs to cover both paper and electronic forms of records uh, to meet the standard. And probably a good idea to, to call out both as a, as a good practice, uh, but you would need to include both of those forms of records. And the policy must specify the method of record uh, destruction. Uh, there might be uh, some challenges if you just simply say the documents will be uh, destroyed. Uh, probably need to specify what form uh, that takes. And then lastly, uh, some guidance on the documentation. So last slide on 8.13. So the documentation required to show that an agency is in compliance with 8.13 is simply a written policy on record retention and destruction. So as long as you have that policy on file, uh, you should be okay. So Kevin, anything uh, to add before if we see there are any questions? I don't. I, th I, think, we're, I think we're good. Great. And we have a question following up, I believe, on 8.12. Uh, can a federal agency restrict uh, which form of indirect uh, rates they will accept? That appears to be the case for CNCS, uh, which forces either the 10% rate or an approved indirect rate. So, Kevin, any, um, any clarity on whether a federal agency uh, can restrict which form of indirect rate they will accept? Uh, actually, there's, there's clarification that they can't. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to go look at the uh, COFAR, C-O-F-A-R, website that has a frequently asked question that specifically addresses that question, and they specifically allow the continuation of using cost allocation as a legitimate method of recovering your indirect costs. So I would, would highly encourage you to, to consult those frequently asked questions on the COFER website and maybe point, point to, to that guidance um, first for that particular funding source. Great, I think we have another question coming in. Uh, yes. Well, it uh, looks like we have a raised hand, but we do not have the ability um, in this format to be able to unmute you, so you will need to put your question into the Q&A box. All right, so we will wait uh, while uh, the person from Jefferson County types in her questions. Uh, but again, while we're waiting for that, just to, to clarify, in addition to uh, the guidance on interpreting the standards and documenting the standards that we have just gone through, um, the Technical Assistance Guide does have those diagnostic questions and uh, the additional resources uh, that I think will help answer some of these more uh, technical questions. Um, and again, let your agency do that overall review um, of the, the quality of their financial uh, policies and procedures. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, Kevin, uh, same question, but can the state enforce the indirect rates? Um, my read on that would, would be no. Uh, I think, you know, I guess I would, would guide you to, to the frequently asked questions again and, and you know, come up with your conclusion and, and have that conversation with your, your state funding source. Great, so uh, again, that's an example of the kind of additional resources um, that we also include so you can, uh, you can address those questions, especially some, with some of the more technical uh, standards in Category 8. So unless we have uh, any additional questions, uh, this concludes our webinar. Again, we will post uh, the final copy of uh, the, gu the Technical Assistance Guide for Category 8 uh, by close of business on Friday on our website. And also uh, make sure that you're checking your calendars and your updates since we have seven more webinars uh, to get through by the end of uh, September. And we'll be rolling out uh, our additional Technical Assistance Guides as they are completed. So this is a busy month uh, for webinars here at the partnership. Uh, so again, make sure that you are checking uh, the schedule and feel more than free to reach out to us if you have any questions about this guide uh, or the uh, forthcoming webinars and additional guides that we are rolling out. So thank you again uh, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Thanks to you that uh, were able to join us at our annual convention last week. And again, we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. So uh, thank you very much and have a great week.